on me. Sure, sure. In, I don't see anything. It's when you go live. Yeah, there's nothing. It's just my Facebook. You're actually live with me. I don't see anything. Ah. Uh, um, you're live with me. You're live with I am? Yeah, you are live now. Okay. Everyone can see you now. So I just... But I don't see... Panuyon, I can't see their comments because... Right now, I see myself using Zoom. Um, don't worry about the comments. We do not intend to answer them. I we'll answer the questions now. We can uh, okay. and then gather up all the questions. You can ask that to me. You can answer all your questions so that you can answer all their questions. Okay, 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 then. Sige. So, all I'm... Right. So, yeah. No, I'm giving life. Sige. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's just about 1.50, so that we have 10 more minutes. Let's wait for the others to join us. Then we will start. I hope that you were able to download the matrix which uh, I sent because we will have to refer to the matrix as we go along. So let's just wait for others to join. I'm sorry, I cannot read the, um, I cannot view actually or see the comments. So if I'm not responding to the comments, uh, please pardon me for not responding. So, hintay-hintay lang tayo para makasama yung iba. So, it's only 1.53. Okay, just to test, can you hear me? Can somebody just double check or text me if um, you can hear me, please? The matrix you can get from the PALS page. I think that was uploaded, if I'm not mistaken, yesterday morning or maybe two days ago. Makikita okay. ko If you can please download the matrix, it's a comparative a matrix of the uh, 1997 rules and the 2019. Okay. Thank you, Carl, for confirming. Thank you, Professor Zarate. Okay, five more minutes will start in time.
again, please make sure that uh, you have the matrix with you because I will, uh, we will have to cross-reference our discussion with the matrix. The matrix was uploaded, I think, yesterday morning, and it's in the Pulse page. And I'm happy to see that uh, some of my former students are likewise listening to us. Okay, it's two o'clock. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Dean Sol Mawis, the College of Love Lyceum, the Philippines University. Um, thank you for joining us. This is actually a project of the Philippine Association of Law Schools. Today, I'm supposed to discuss with you the uh, amendments, the 2019 proposed amendments to the 1997 Rules of Civil Procedure. Now, um, Siguro para mas, ma, mas maayos ang ating talakayan ngayong araw na to, let me just discuss with you certain admin matters. Number one, at ulit ko, I think I sound like a broken record already. Just make sure you have the matrix with you because I will cross-reference this discussion with the provisions in the matrix. And then uh, secondly, this will be a three-hour uh, per session uh, discussion so siguro matatapos natin for the first three hours hanggang siguro tayo mga hanggang rule 15, no? Or 13 to 15 yan siguro. And then yung susunod na session ay sa Wednesday, ganung oras din. So this one's going to be 2 to 5. But I will have a break at around maybe 2 to 2.30 so that um, one, of the, one of the deans or maybe our executive director will be able to join us and upload the matrix for everybody to see. Okay, 
Now, the questions you may have during the discussions, just please type it because I will not be able to read them. Uh, but I will answer them siguro sa susunod na session. Or kung may time tayo, babasahin ko lahat yun. Okay. Before we start, and I always start my class with a prayer. So may I invite, or invite everybody to join me in a prayer, please. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together. Thank you, Lord, for um, giving, allowing us to be in good health. We ask you, Lord, to be with us as we discuss these new provisions in law. Send your Holy Spirit that uh, we may be able to discuss these provisions and be able to understand them to the best of our abilities. All of this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Okay, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Okay, this is the first time I'm doing this, so pagpasensyahan nyo na because I was just telling one of the deans earlier, nakakakaba pala to, you know. You just talk and talk and you don't see the reaction of people. And then I, am not, I do not know whether you, you're understanding me or not. So if you have any concerns, just type it and we will answer them. Okay. Now let me start now with the uh, first. Okay. Let's first understand why was there a need to amend the rules of court, particularly sex, rule 6 to 35. Ang hindi naman ang entire civil procedure ang na-amend. Ang na-amend lamang is 6 hanggang 35. Kaya ang i-discuss ko lamang is 6 to 35. Okay. Now, pangalawa, okay, may mga ibang provisions that were not substantially amended. Okay. And kung may amend, may uh, pagbabago lamang is simply because of it. The, it, they, it more or less parang pang gender inclusiveness. Instead of his only, ginawang his or her at saka yung consistent na amendment instead of saying 15 days. Ngayon ay 15 calendar days. I'm raising this now and discussing it now because I will not discuss those points anymore because that will be recurring amendments. Okay. Now, as I said earlier, bakit ba kinailangan na magkaroon na amendahan yung 1997 rules of civil procedure? As stated in the resolution itself, okay, there is a need to make the disposition of action and proceeding more just, speedy, in and inexpensive, as well as to prevent delays and to decongest the courts. Kaya kung mapapansin nyo, the, the, uh, the common denominator ng pagbabago ay para mas mapabilis ang proseso sa korte. Okay, having said that, okay, let's start now with the discussions. Okay. Section, I'll start with Rule 6. Rule 6, kinds of pleadings. Okay, Section 1 was not changed at all. Pleadings defined and pleadings are the written statements of the respective claims and defenses of the parties submitted to the court for appropriate judgment. Walang pagbabago dyan. Ngayon, look at your Section 2. Pleadings allowed. The claims of a party are asserted in a complaint, counterclaim, cross-claim, third-party complaint, or complaint and intervention. The defenses of a party are alleged in the answer to the pleading asserting a claim. An answer may be responded to by a reply only if the defending party attaches an actionable document to the reply. Okay, so very clear from section two of rule six. Reply is only required when the answer is founded on an actionable document. Ngayon, bakit kayo magpa-file ng reply? Because the answer is founded on the action of, on an actionable document and you want to deny the due execution and authenticity of that actionable document. So you only file a reply, as I said, if you want to deny the due execution and authenticity of an actionable document which was attached to the answer. And what is an actionable document? It is a written instrument or document on which an action or defense is founded. It, can, it may be pleaded two ways. Number one, by setting forth the substance of such document in the pleading, and you attach the document there too. Number two, by setting forth said document verbatim in the pleading. Kinopya lahat. But napaka klaro dito sa section 2 rule 6. Now, by express provision of law, the actionable document should be attached to the answer. Okay. Ang tanong nga dyan, okay, kinopyo mo pero hindi mo inattach sa answer. Hindi na ba yan mako-consider na actionable document? 
Now, if I go by the, by the provision of the law for it to be considered an actionable document, it must be pleaded in the manner which I stated earlier and it must be attached to the answer. Okay, complaint. The complaint is a pleadings uh, is the pleading alleging the plaintiffs or claiming parties costs or causes of action. The names and residences of the plaintiff and defendant must be stated in the complaint. Ano ang pinakabago lang dito sa section 3, yung phrase or claiming parties, you know? or claiming parties cause of action. And I think the claiming party here, and it's a good actually addition, so that it may refer to a third party complainant or the defendant in relation to his permissive counterclaim. Answer section 4, walang pagbabago. Okay, now listen carefully to section 5 and I will read it. Okay. Defenses may either be negative or affirmative. A negative defense is the specific denial of the material fact or facts alleged to the pleading of the claimant essential to his or her causes of action. An affirmative defense is an allegation of a new matter, which while hypothetically admitting the material allegations in the pleading of the claimant, would nevertheless prevent or bar recovery by him or her. The affirmative defenses include fraud, statute of limitations, release, payment, illegality, statute of frauds, estoppel, former recovery, discharge in bankruptcy, and any other matter by way of confession and avoidance. Affirmative defenses may also include for the dismissal of a complaint specifically that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, that there is another action pending between the same parties, for the same cause or that the action is barred by prior judgment. Okay. Now, an answer therefore may raise the following. A negative defense, which consists in defendant's specific denial of the material fact that the plaintiff alleges in his complaint. Okay. And we know that there are three modes of denying. The first one is the defendant must specify each material allegation of the fact, the truth of which he does not admit, and whenever practicable, set forth the substance of the matters on which he will rely to support his denial. So lalabas siya sa under I speak. The defendant specifically denies the allegations contained in paragraph 2 of the complaint, the truth of the matter being that. Kailangan niyong sabihin yung rason. Kasi kung wala yung rason, ang miski ka nag-specific denial, deemed admitted yan. Pangalawang pamamaraan, when the defendant is without knowledge and information sufficient to form a belief as to the truth of a material averment made in the complaint. He shall so state and they shall have the effect of a denial. Example, I specifically deny the allegations contained in paragraph two of the complaint, the truth of, for lack of information sufficient to form a belief as to the truth and falsity thereof. Okay. Maaari din naman partial denial, partial admission. Under the 1997 Rules of Court, notice that the ground mentioned now, uh, the grounds in Rule 16 of the 1997, yung grounds for purposes of filing a motion to dismiss kung natatandaan yung Rule 16, okay? Yan can be pleaded also as an affirmative defense. Now, under the, under the 2019 rules, wala na tayong Rule 16. Totally na-delete na yan. Wala na, totally na-repeal. Okay. Yung grounds ngayon ng Rule 16, okay, may now be raised okay, in, as and by way of affirmative defense. So ang mangyayari dyan sa imagine your complaint, ano, ay, sa, I'm sorry, the answer. Ang lalamanin ng answer nyo, ano? First, your admissions, then your specific denials, okay? And then your, um, your affirmative Defenses, okay, or affirmative defenses, which can be your grounds, which are the grounds raised in the former Rule 16. Now, with the repeal of the entire Rule 16, therefore, all the grounds enumerated in the former Rule 16 may now be raised as affirmative, de uh, affirmative defenses in the answer. At ano-ano yon? Number one, that the court has no jurisdiction over the person of the defending party that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter of the claim. Three, the venue is improperly. 
full legal capacity to sue. Three, that there is pendencia for res judicata. Then the pleading asserting the claim states no cause of action. The claim or demand set forth in the plaintiff's pleading has been paid, waived, abandoned, or otherwise extinguished. The claim on which the action is founded is enforceable under the uh, provisions of the statute of frauds and that the pleading precedent for the, cl uh, for the claim has not been complied with. Okay. Yang mga grounds na yan, dapat erase nyo yan sa uh, answer by way of affirmative defenses kasi wala nang, wala, nang, wala nang Rule 16. Pero sa grounds na yan, may apat na pwede kang mag-file ng motion to dismiss, okay? Which is pursuant to Section 1 of, the, of Rule 15 of the 2019 amendments, okay? So, ano yung mga grounds na yon? Lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, litis pendensya, res judicata, okay, and prescription. Now, in other words, okay, with the repeal of Rule 16, all those grounds mentioned are under Rule 16, pleaded by way of affirmative defense, which you will put in your answer. A motion to dismiss can only be filed now, uh, come May, no? Under the 2019 rules, okay? Pwede lang kayo mag-file ng motion to dismiss on four grounds. Lack of jurisdiction, okay, over the subject matter, litis pendensya, res judicata, and prescription. Is that clear? Okay. In fact, if we go later to section one of rule nine, the court on its own can dismiss a complaint when it appears from the pleadings or the evidence on record that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter on the ground of litis pendentia, on the ground of limite, of, uh, of res judicata, and then litis pendentia and statute of limitations. That is pursuant to section one, rule nine of the 2019 rules. Okay, now let's now go to section seven. Okay, section seven. Actually, the sec section seven of the 2019 rules, hindi naman masyadong inamend, okay? Merong amendment lang sa bandang dulo, okay? Which is consistent with jurisprudence. Let's read section seven. A compulsory counterclaim is one which being cognizable by the regular courts of justice arises out of or is connected with the transaction or occurrence constituting the subject matter of the opposing party's claim, okay? and does not require for its adjudication third, the presence of third parties of whom the court cannot acquire jurisdiction. Such a counterclaim must be within the jurisdiction of the court, both as to the amount and the nature thereof, except that an original action from the RTC, the counterclaim may be considered compulsory regardless of the amount. At ito na yung amendment. A compulsory counterclaim not raised in the same action is barred unless otherwise allowed by the rules, which is consistent with jurisprudence. Okay, now, so what is made clear under the, under the amendment is that a compulsory counterclaim not raised in the same action is barred. You cannot file a separate independent action on that. Okay, so what is a counterclaim? As defined under Section 6, Rule 6, of the 2019 rules, okay, as it is any claim which a defending party may have against an opposing party. They are generally allowed in order to avoid multiplicity of suits and to facilitate the disposition of the whole controversy in a single action, such that the defendant's demand may be adjudged by a counterclaim rather than by an independent suit. And what are the limitations? Okay, para ka mag raise ng counterclaim. Number one, the court should have jurisdiction over the subject matter of the counterclaim. Number two, that it could acquire jurisdiction over third parties whose presence is, is essential for its jurisdiction. And that is based on the ruling of Lafarge Cement Philippines versus Continental Cement. Okay. Paano mo ngayon malalaman? Okay, so there are two kinds of counterclaims, di ba? Isang counterclaim na compulsory, isang counterclaim na permissive. Now, ang tanong, paano mo malalaman kung yung counterclaim na nire-raise mo sa iyong answer e permissive o counter or 
compulsory. Ask yourself these questions. Okay. And if the answer to all these questions, lahat yan yes, okay, then, it, then you know that your counterclaim is a compulsory counterclaim. So una, ano ba yung mga questions na yan? Okay. Based on the case of Bungkayao versus Fort Ilocandia, first question, are issues of fact and law raised by the claim and by the counterclaim largely the same? Second question, would res judicata bar a subsequent suit or defendant's claim absent the compulsory counterclaim? Ito yung pinaka mas, mas logical na tanong. Eh, no? Will substantially the same evidence support or refute plaintiff's claim? as well as defendant's counterclaim. At ito yung pinaka-importante sa lahat. Is there any logical connection or relations between the claim and the counterclaim? A positive answer to all these questions would indicate, therefore, that the compulsory counterclaim is, that the counterclaim is compulsory. Unang-una, bakit ba natin kailangan na magkaroon, na malaman ang distinction kung, kung ang ating counterclaim E compulsory o hindi. Unang-una, okay, kaya natin dapat malaman kung compulsory or hindi comp or permissive yung counterclaim natin. Pagka compulsory, hindi na kailangan sa sa answer nyo magkaroon kayo ng certificate of non-forum shopping. Pero pag ang nire-raise nyo e permissive counterclaim, then it is a must that, the comp that your answer with, comp with permissive counterclaim must contain a certificate of non-forum shopping. Why? Because a permissive counterclaim is considered an initiatory pleading. Number two, sa compulsory counterclaim, okay, because of the suspension of OCA circular number 96-2009, okay, where it clarified that the filing fee of the compulsory counterclaim has been suspended hindi tayo magbabayad ng filing fee on the compulsory counterclaim. Pero ang permissive counterclaim, magbabayad tayo ng docket fees dyan. Okay? Kundi the court will not be able to acquire jurisdiction on your permissive counterclaim, lalong-lalo na, okay, syempre kung talagang ang pag, hindi mo pagbayad eh, because it's intentional and deliberate, then Manchester, the ruling in Manchester will now be followed. But of course, if it's unintentional, nagkulang lang yung bayad mo, hindi ka agad dyan i-dismiss. Ang mag a ngayon dyan is yung sun life assurance. Okay. Now, pangatlo. Okay. When you speak of compulsory counterclaim, you have to raise it. Because if you don't raise that compulsory counterclaim, tulad ng nabanggit natin kanina, din bar. Hindi ka pwede mag-file ng panibagong kaso. Tapos yung subject matter ng kaso mo ay yung dapat ni raise mo by way of compulsory counterclaim. Eh ang permissive counterclaim, miski hindi mo ni raise yan dun sa asunto na yon, you can file a separate action. Okay? Clear, ha? Huh? Okay. Now, the rule in permissive counterclaims is that for the trial court to acquire jurisdiction, the counterclaimant is bound to pay the prescribed docket fees. Since the petitioner in the case of GSIAS versus heirs of Caballero did not pay the docket fees, the RTC did not acquire jurisdiction over its permissive counterclaim. Okay. Section 9, yung counterclaims and cross counter and counter cross claims, walang pagbabago. Okay. Ito ang medyo may pagbabago. Okay. And um, I just would like to greet, okay, para naman ako nasa radyo. Okay. Our commissioner, Commissioner Jojo Sorera T, who's a commissioner of uh, the Legal Education Board. Mas lalo akong kinabahan. Anyway, okay. Section 10. Ito ang malaking pagbabago din. All new matters alleged in the answer are deemed controverted. So pag-file mo ng complaint, pag-file ka ng answer, deemed controverted. Pinagtatalunan. Okay. Kaya hindi ka na dapat mag-file ng reply. But, if the plaintiff wishes to interpose any claims arising out of the new matters so alleged in the answer, such claims shall set forth it in an amended or supplemental complaint. However, the plaintiff may file a reply only if the defending party attaches an actionable document to his or her answer. A reply is a pleading, the office or function of which is to deny or allege facts in denial or avoidance of new matters alleged 
in or relating to said actionable document. In the event of an actionable document attached to the reply, the defendant may file a rejoinder if the same is based solely on an actionable document. So anong ibig sabihin ng pagbabago sa Section 9? Complaint, answer. Kung ang answer hindi naman founded if the defenses in the answer okay, are not founded on an actionable document and you want now to and the plaintiff wants to controvert new matters in the answer, hindi reply ang ipafile. Ang ipafile mo, it's either i-amend mo yung complaint mo or you file a supplemental complaint. Ngayon, kung wala namang new matters na ni-raise, ang katapusan ng pleading nyo hanggang answer lang. Now, however, if the answer is founded on an actionable document and the plaintiff would like to deny the due execution and authenticity of the said document which was attached to the answer, then the plaintiff can file a reply. If a reply is founded on an actionable document, yan, the defendant, the defendant okay, can file now a rejoinder to deny the due execution and authenticity of an actionable document that was attached to the reply. Okay. So kung makikita nyo, iniigsian, yung in, binabawasan o O, hindi pwede kami kahit anong pleading, basta file ka lang ng file. Ngayon, may rason bakit ka nagpa-file. Okay? Now, look at your section 11. A third, a third fourth party complaint is a claim that a defending party may with leave of court file against a person not a party to the action called the third fourth party defendant for contribution Indemnity, indemnity, subrogation, or any other relief in respect of his or her opponent's claim. I call that CISO. Contribution, indemnification, okay, uh, subrogation, or other relief in respect of his or her opponent's claim. The third party complaint shall be denied admission, okay, and the court shall require the defendant to institute a separate action where a third fourth party defendant cannot be located within 30 calendar days from the grant of such leave. Matters extraneous to the issue or B, matters extraneous to the issue in the principal case are race or C, the effect would be to introduce a new and separate controversy into the action. It is very clear therefore for the amendment, okay, from the amendments, okay, now my grounds now for, for the court to deny, okay, uh, a motion to admit third party complaint. But let me first stress that the admission of a third party complaint lies with the sound discretion of the court. If leave to file a third party complaint is denied, the proper remedy is to file a separate case, not to insist on the admission of a third party complaint all the way up to the Supreme Court. And that is the ruling in the case of DBP versus Clarges Realty Corp. GR number 170060. Now, notice that the order granting the motion to admit third party complaint, okay? Nagfile ako ng motion to admit third party complaint, granted. But based on the amendment, it would appear that even if it was granted, the court may recall the order granting it if the defendant, okay? Cannot if the defendant to the third the third party defendant cannot be located within 30 calendar days from the grant of such leave. Okay. Anong ibig sabihin cannot be located okay within 30 calendar days from the grant of such leave. That's it. Okay. Ibig sabihin hindi siguro ma serving summons. So nung binabasa ko to at saka yung rule 14 sa summons na isip ko O sige, kunwari, so the defendant cannot be found. Okay, his whereabouts are unknown. Pero dun sa Rule 14, Section 16 ng Panibagong Rules. Okay, Rule 14, Section 16 ng Panibagong Rules. Nakalagay dun, okay, I, okay, nakalagay na if the whereabouts of the defendants, okay, of the defendant is unknown, you can serve summons by publication. Okay, in any action for that matter, and I'm referring to 
Section 7, 16, Rule 14, service upon defendant whose identity or whereabouts are unknown. Okay. So I'm trying to I'm trying to reconcile these two provisions. Kasi sabi dito nga sa Section 11, okay, the court shall, okay, the third party complaint shall be denied admission and the court shall require the defendant to institute a separate action where A, the, the third party defendant cannot be located within 30 calendar days from the grant of such leave. So I filed a motion to admit third party complaint, granted. Someone's now was trying to be served, okay, on the third party defendant. But the third party defendant within a period of 30 days cannot be located. What will now happen? The court now can recall the order granting the third party uh, complaint. Okay. But my question in my mind, and I said I do not want to venture a wild guess, and I would, I would rather wait for the Supreme Court to issue a ruling on this matter when the proper time comes. Does it mean, therefore, that we cannot avail, the third party plaintiff cannot avail of Section 16? Rule 14, okay, of the 19 uh, of the 2019 rules of court, where in the said provision it provides if the defendant's whereabouts are unknown, one can ask the court and ask permission that the sum that the summons be served through publication. Okay, now there are other grounds by which on which a third party, a motion to admit a third party complaint can be denied. Matters extraneous to the issue in the principal case are raised, or the effect would be to introduce a new and separate controversy into the action. As I said, in the case of DBP, if your motion to admit third party complaint is denied, you don't insist that it should go up to the Supreme Court. The remedy is to just file an independent separate action. Okay. Now, for those who are students, maybe it would be nice to know what are the requisites for, or re remember or recall, what are the requisites for a third party action? Number one, that the third part, that the party to be impleted is not yet a party to the action. Number two, that the claim against the third party defendant must belong to the original defendant. Number three, the claim of the original defendant against the third party defendant must be based on plaintiff's claim against the original defendant. Pinapasa niya kasi doon sa third party defendant. Number four, the defendant in the main case is attempting to transfer the third party defendant, the liability asserted against him by the original plaintiff. Now, and that is the case of Phil Franco Service Enterprises versus Paras. Okay. Section 12, bringing new parties, wala naman tayong pagbabago dyan. At in Section 13, wala naman except, katulad nga na nabanggit ko sa inyo, the change referred to gender inclusiveness only, meaning his or her na, hindi puros his lang. Okay? Now, Rule 7. Okay. Okay, in Rule 7, okay, if you have your matrix with you or your rules of court, Sections 1, caption of the pleading, 2, Section 2, the body, okay, Section uh, 2, 1 and 2, no changes, okay, still the same provisions. Now let's go to Section 3, kasi ito substantive ang change, okay. Section 3, Signature and Address. Okay. Let me just read the provision first, then we go on to the comments. Every pleading and other written submissions to the court must be signed by the party or counsel representing him or her. The signature of counsel constitutes a certificate, okay, by him or her that he or she has read the pleading and document that to the best of his or her knowledge, information, and belief, formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances, A, it is not being presented for any improper purpose, such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. 
B, the claims or defenses and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or jurisprudence or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing jurisprudence. C, the factual contentions have evidentiary support or if specifically so identified, we likely have evidentiary support after availment of the modes of discovery under the rules. And number five, okay, the denials of factual contentions are warranted on the evidence or if specifically so identified are reasonably based on belief or lack of information. And this is very important. The rules further provide that if the court determines on motion or motu proprio on its own, and after notice and hearing that this rule has been violated, it may impose an appropriate sanction or refer such violation to proper office for disciplinary action on any attorney, law firm, or any party that violated the rule or is responsible for the violation. Absent exceptional circumstances, a law firm shall be held jointly and severally liable for a violation committed by its partner, associate, or employee. The sanction may include, but shall not be limited to non-monetary directive or sanction, an order to pay a penalty in court, or if imposed on motion and warranted for effective deterrence, an order directing payment to the movement of part or all of the reasonable attorney's fees and other expenses, okay, directly resulting from the violation, including attorney's fees, okay, uh, for the filing of the motion for sanction. The lawyer, or law firm cannot pass on the monetary penalty on the client. Okay. Okay, this one is really very earth shaking, especially for the lawyers and practitioners. Okay. You know, when a lawyer affixes his signature on a pleading, in effect, okay, based on the rules, he guarantees the following. He certifies that the uh, certifies the following. Number one, that he has read the pleading in the document. Number two, to the best of his knowledge or information and belief, which information in belief was formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances. But what is reasonable, what is inquiry reasonable under the circumstances in the Andini final rules? Okay. If he affixes his signature on the pleading, the lawyer further certifies that it is not being presented for any improper purpose such as to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. He further certifies that the claims, defenses, and other legal contentions are warranted by existing law or jurisprudence or by a non-frivolous argument for extending, modifying, or reversing existing jurisprudence. Kung baga sinasabi niya talaga itong final kong kaso o itong answer na final ko, talagang ito, kung baga it's based on law, hindi ito parang contrive or katang isip lamang. Now, and this is also important, the lawyer when he affixes his signature, the factual contentions have evidentiary support. Hindi na pwedeng attitude bahala na si Batman. Okay? The factual contentions have evidentiary support or if specifically so identified, will likely have evidentiary support after availment of the modes of discovery under these rules. And the denials of such factual contentions are likewise warranted by evidence, or if so specifically so identified and reasonably based on belief or lack of information. Okay. Yaan ang kumbaga ginagarantihan pag ikaw abogado, pinirmahan mo yung pili. Ibig sabihin, lahat ng sinasabi mo sa korte, katotohanan lamang, at merong evidentiary support. At ito ay, you know, it can be, be, and it's likewise legal, you know, it's based on law. As I said, hindi yung basta bahala na lang mag-file ng kaso, tapos haya mo na pagka magka-trial, saka ko maghahanap ng ebidensya. You don't do that. Okay, now. In fact, if the court det determines on its own, ha, on its own, or upon motion of the other party, of course, there's no going to be notice and hearing, that the above rule has been violated, nalama na, pangharas lamang pala ito, what can happen? The court may impose an appropriate sanction or refer such violation to the proper office for disciplinary 
action on any attorney, law firm, or party that violated the rule or is responsible for the violation. Naku, baka ma ma disbar pa yan. Okay? That would be agang kasi proper sanction. So ano pwede mangyari? Mag-complain ka na itong abogadong to ay nagdidemanda na wala palang ebidensya. Okay? Number two, absent exceptional circumstances. And this, to my mind, is really very, how would I put it, very scary, no? A law firm shall be held jointly and severally liable for a violation committed by its partner, associate, or employee. So, anong ibig sabihin yan? If you are in a law office, hindi na lang pwedeng sasabihin ng partner, o sige, bahala ka na dyan, associate, bahala ka na, ikaw nang bahala dyan. They really have to work together. Because if the associate falters, okay, and then knowingly filed a case that wala palang ebidensya, pati yung partner sabit, okay. The sanction may include but shall not be limited to non-monetary directive or sanction an order to pay a penalty in court or if imposed on motion and warranted for effective deterrence, an order directing payment to the movement of part or all of the reasonable attorney's fees and other expenses directly resulting from the violation, including attorney's fees for the filing of the sanction. Imagine the lawyer will be paying fees, okay? By way of sanction, okay? And the lawyer or law firm cannot pass on the monetary penalty to the client. That's how serious this is. Kung impose ka ng sanction, Okay. At pinagbayad ka ng court, let's say, ng 5,000 pesos. Yung 5,000 pesos mang gagaling yan sa bulsa, ng bulsa ng abogado. Hindi pwede yan singilin sa kapila. Now, which... I, I will share this because this is just my personal observation. I hope you don't mind me sharing with you the personal observation. You know, when you're a lawyer, of course, there's parang ano yan eh. Lahat naman ng abogado, yung mga sinusulat, base yan sa kwento. Okay, base yan sa representation ng client. Okay. Dapat sana siguro pagkaroon, siguro nagkaroon ng agreement. And this to my mind, you know, the rules of court, the new, the, the proposals, will have a change. There will, be, there will be a paradigm shift in the lawyer-client relationship. Why? Because syempre, I don't want to be sued for this, di ba? So syempre, pag nag-usap kayo kami ng kliyente, papipirmahan ko na lahat ng sinasabi mo sa akin, pawang katotohanan lamang. At lahat ng binibigay mo sa aking ebidensya ay pawang katotohanan lang, lamang. Para meron akong depensa na hindi ako nagpumunta sa korte tapos yung pala ay sued lang on the basis of wild imagination. Okay? It, I think there should be an agreement between the lawyer and the client so that the lawyer naman can protect himself. Okay? Now, notice in Section 3B okay, of Rule 7, it is incumbent upon the lawyer to verify the representations of the client. But as I said earlier, okay, ano ba yung definition ng inquiry reasonable under the circumstances? Yan hindi pa na-define ng court. Now, the pleading, if also I will discuss this again in, the, in, in another, in another uh, rule. But here, sinabi na that the pleading is no longer based on ultimate facts but on evidentiary facts, okay? Now, very important yan, okay? Lalo na pagka nag, nagkuha tayo ng bar at sinabing gumawa ng complaint, okay? And I will discuss that later. Now, let me go now to verifi verification, okay? Except when otherwise specifically required by law or rule, pleadings need not be verified under oath. A pleading is verified by an affidavit of an affiant duly authorized to sign said verification. The authorization of the affiant to act on behalf of a party, whether in the form of a secretary certificate or special power of attorney should be attached to the pleading and shall allege the following. That specific provision in the 2019 proposal, very clear that if, you're, if the person who's going to verify is not, let's say, the plaintiff or the defendant, Okay, and the pleading has to be verified. The authority of the person to, be, to verify the said document should now form part of the pleading to be verified. Yung SPA or yung sex cert or yung director certificate kung corporation yung defendant or yung plaintiff. 
at paano mag-verify. Okay. Under the old rules, okay, under the old rules, I'm not, I don't want to call it pala old. Kasi current pa rin ngayon yan eh. Mag, mag, this, this new 2019 rules will take effect in May. So technically, hindi pa siya old. The current rules, okay. Paano ba tayo mag-verify? Okay, di ba sa verification, ang nilalagay natin, number one, I'm the plaintiff in the form of caption case. I have read the said, uh, the contents of the, of the complaint and they are true based on my own personal knowledge or based on authentic documents. Di ba? That are correct and ganyan. Okay. Ang verification ngayon, ang verification come May will be different. Bakit? Because under Section 4 of Rule 7, 2019, there are additional attestations that must be included. Okay. Thus, the verification must contain the following. Number one, the allegations in the pleading are true and correct based on his or her personal knowledge or based on authentic documents. Yan, nasa current rules yan. Number two, ito wala. The pleading is not filed to harass, cause unnecessary delay, or needlessly increase the cost of litigation. And number three, the factual allegations therein have evidentiary support, or if specifically so identified, will likewise have evidentiary support after reasonable opportunity for discovery. Yaan, kailangan na yan kasama sa verification. Okay. What is the purpose ba of verification? It is to secure an assurance that the allegations in the pleading are true and correct and have been filed in good faith, according to the case of Salenga versus Court of Appeals. Now, paano kung defective yung verification? May nagkulang kayong paragraph. Yaan ba ay eh, i-dismiss ng korte? Sabi sa kaso ng Torres versus Codilla, 2012 case, a defective verification is merely a formal defect which does not affect the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Kaya anong gagawin ng plaintiff? Kunwari, plaintiff dapat nag-file ng verified complaint. Napansin ng defendant, kulang-kulang yung verification. Mag-file lang siya ng motion na ipa-verify niya yung complaint. At kung yung court mag-issue ng order na i-verify yung complaint, dapat sumunod ang plaintiff. At magbigay siya at baguhin niya yung verification and let the verification comply. Okay? Comply with the rules. Okay, now. Section 5, Certification Against Forum Shopping. Okay. Okay. Yung provisions currently, isang amendment na na-introduce dyan. Okay. And yung amendment na yun is the authorization of the affiant okay, to act on behalf of a party, whether in the form of a secretary certificate or a special power of attorney, should be attached to the pleading. Okay. So anong ibig sabihin nun? Kung kunwari, corporate, eh, corporasyon, no? at may, mag, magkakaroon ng certification on non-forum shopping, the authority of the person executing the certificate against forum shopping should now form part okay, of that certification. Dapat naka-attach. Okay. Please take note of the general rule on, on the rules on certificate of non-forum shopping. What is the general rule? According to the case of Lokias versus Ombudsman, it is the plaintiff or the principal party who shall certify under oath that he has not commenced any action involving the same issues in any court. Okay? The attestation contained in the certification requires personal knowledge by the party who executed the same. So the rule is hindi pwede abogado, dapat parties. At lahat ng, ng petitioners or plaintiffs dapat mag-execute sila. Yan ang general rule according to the case of Lopez versus Ombudsman. Ngayon, ano yung exception sa general rule? Isa dyan yung kaso na nabanggit ni Docena versus Lepesura. Okay. When the plaintiffs, okay, the interests of the plaintiffs are uh, closely intertwined because in the case of Docena versus Lepesura, mag-asawa yan eh, husband and wife. Ang subject ng kaso, conjugal property nila. Ngayon, ang nagpirma lang ng certificate of non-forum shopping is just what? Is the husband, hindi sinama yung wife. Defective ba yun? Dapat ba i-dismiss yan? The answer is no. There is no justifiable reason, according to the Supreme Court, why he may not lawfully undertake together with his wife to inform the court of any similar action or proceeding which he may be part. 
if anybody may reproject that certification or undertaking for having been incorrectly made, it is the wife who may conceivably do so. Okay, the husband may reasonably be presumed to have personal knowledge of the filing or non-filing of his wife of any action because precisely their interests are directly intertwined. Okay, now. So, um, okay, in fact, in the case of heirs of Gallardo versus Suleiman, okay, the signature of one of the petitioners in the certification against forum sub shopping substantially complied with the rules because all the petitioners share a common interest and invoke a common cause of action or defense. Pero kung hindi sila common cause of action, hindi common defense, for example, okay, common cause of action rather, okay, or common interest, dapat lahat ng plaintiffs, lahat ng petitioners mag execute ng certificate of non-forum shopping. Now, sa isang kaso, Chua versus Torres, okay, may magkapatid sila, brother, sister. The brother issued a check, okay, and now the check was dishonored. Now, a civil case was filed against the brother. Oh, no, a criminal case was filed against the brother. Kaya lang nung sinerve yung warrant of arrest, ang naaresto yung sister. Nurse pa naman yung sister sa nursing school. Siya yung naaresto, so siya yung nakulong. Eh, wala naman siyang alam dun sa kaso. So what the sister did was to file a civil case against the, defend, the plaintiff, in the complainant, and now defendant, no? So dinimanda niya, pero ang ginangyari, it is sister and brother versus the defendant. Okay. Sabi nga yun ng defendant, okay, um, dapat i-dismiss because ang pumirwa lang ng certificate of non-forum shopping was the sister. The brother was not included. Now, anong sabi ng Supreme Court? Actually, based on the allegations of the complaint, the brother is a misjoined party. Wala naman siya sa kwento. Kanino ba yung cause of action? The cause of action belongs to the sister, hindi naman doon sa brother. Sino bang inaresto na walang bas yan? It was the sister, hindi yung brother. Pero, so sabi, kaya, ang sabi ng Supreme Court, since the misjoined, since the misjoined party plaintiffs receives no recognition from the court as either an indispensable or necessary party plaintiff, then it follows that whatever action or inaction the misjoined party may take on the verification or certification against forum shopping is inconsequential. So anong ibig sabihin nun? Na ang dapat mag execute ng, ng certification, okay, ay eh yung either um, yung necessary or indispensable party. Pero kung misjoined party ka, okay, at hindi ka naka-execute ng certification on non-forum shopping, okay lang kasi sa totoong buhay, hindi ka naman dapat talaga kasali. Okay. Now, there is a rule when it comes to juridical uh, entities, okay? The following officials, and this is the general rule as held in the case of Cagayan Valley versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue, okay? The following officials or employees of the company can sign the verification and certification without need of a board resolution, okay? And these are the following corporate officers who can sign the certification on non-forum shopping, okay, without need of a board resolution. Number one, the president of a corporation. Number two, the general manager or acting general manager. Number three, the personal officer. And number four, an employment specialist in a labor case. Yaan, pwede yan mag-execute, okay, hindi na kinakailangan, Okay, ng hindi na kinakailangan ng certificate ng board dress. Okay, okay. There is one question. There's one question, and allow me lang to read the question because it came in from friend. Okay, what is the effect of the failure to file a reply to an answer whose defense is founded on an actionable document? Okay, you are correct when you said that if you fail to file, okay, a reply to an answer. That, has, that is based on an actionable document, then the due execution and authenticity, okay? Then the due execution and authenticity of the actionable document are deemed admitted. But all other allegations pursuant to Section 10 of Rule 6 are deemed controverted. Okay, is that clear? Okay, now. 
So let's now go to contents. Okay, and again, this is one of the um, uh, heavily amended one. Let me just read the provision, please. Okay. Every pleading stating a party's claim or defenses shall, in addition to those mentioned or mandated by Section 2, Rule 17, okay, Rule 17, uh, Rule 7, I'm sorry, state the following. Names of witnesses who will be presented to prove a party's claim or defense. Again, I will repeat that. Every pleading stating a party's claim or defenses, so every complaint or answer, okay, shall in addition to those mandated under Section 2, Rule 7. Ano ba yung Section 2, Rule 7? Okay? Yung Section 2, Rule 7, okay, just give me a minute, please. Okay? Section 2, Rule 7, Ito yung, okay, ito yung paragraphs, yung the body, okay, yung nilalaman. In addition to that, ano pa dapat ang nakalagay sa, sa complaint or uh, answer? Number one, the names of witnesses who will be presented to prove a party's claim or defense. Number two, summary of the witnesses' intended testimonies provided that the judicial affidavits of said witnesses shall be attached to the pleading and form an integral part hereof. Number three, only witnesses whose judicial affidavits are attached to the pleading shall be presented by the parties during trial, except if a party presents meritorious reasons as basis for the admission of additional witnesses no other witnesses or affidavits shall be heard or submitted by the court. Letter C, documentary and object evidence in support of the allegations mentioned in the pleading. Okay, let me just focus on section six because as I said, that was really, that's a new provision, okay? And kumbaga yung foundation ng pagkaalam natin ng papaano magdawa ng pleading, iba na, okay? Because of section six, okay? Now, Section 1, Rule 8, okay, let me just refer you first to Section 1, Rule 8, requires that every pleading shall contain in a methodical and logical form a plain, concise, and direct statement of the ultimate facts, including the evidence on which the party pleading relies for his or her claim or defense, including the evidence. Okay. So consistent with Rule 8, Section 1, Sabi ngayon ng Section 6, Rule 7, kailangan mo nang ilagay sa complaint mo at sa answer mo yung pangalan ng mga witnesses, okay, who you intend to present to prove your claim or defense, the summaries of their intended testimonies, and in fact, you are required to even attach, okay, even attach the uh, judicial affidavits of your witnesses. At pag hindi mo na attach no other witnesses or affidavit shall be heard or admitted by the court. But I will clarify that when we hit Rule 18. No? And the documentary and object evidence in support thereof. Okay. First, what is the difference between ultimate facts and evidential facts? Okay. In the case of Far East Marble versus CA, Ultimate facts are the essential and substantial facts which either form the basis of the primary right and duty or which directly make up the wrongful acts or omissions of the defendant. The term ultimate facts means the essential facts constituting the plaintiff's cause of action, which means if a fact cannot be stricken off, okay, without leaving the, a fact is essential or ultimate, if it cannot be stricken off without leaving the statement of the cause of action insufficient. So kailangan na handun yung fact na yun kasi kung wala yun, wala kang cause of action. Let's differentiate it therefore with the word evidentiary facts. Kung ang ultimate facts is yung fact na dapat i-allege at kasi kung hindi mo i-allege at wala kang cause of action, okay. evidentiary facts are those which tend to prove or establish said ultimate facts, still as stated in the case of Far East Marble versus CA. Or they are the facts which furnish evidence of existence of some other fact. 
So ang complaint ngayon, ang defense ngayon, lalo ng complaint, based on ultimate facts and evidentiary facts. Kaya kinakailangan lahat ng ebidensya na available na sa iyo, okay, bago mo pa i-file yung kaso, na handun na sa complaint. Okay. Anong ibig sabihin yan okay, sa atin? Number one, because the JA is now required okay, to be attached to the complaint or even to the answer, it impliedly modif um, amended, not modified, but amended okay, the provisions on the JA rule. Bakit ko na sinabing it impliedly amended the provisions on the judicial affidavit rule? Kasi di ba sa JA, we are required to submit our judicial affidavits at least five days before the scheduled pre-trial conference. Okay, under the rules now, particularly as stated in Section 6 okay, okay, of Rule 7, yung JA kailangan naka-attach na yan. Anong implications niyan? Doon sa mga abogado hong nakikinig, okay? Pag nag-file na ho tayo ng kaso, sumuwari complaint, naku, talagang mahirap. Dahil hindi naman mahirap, dapat naman talaga alam natin kung ano yung, yung ebidensya. Kaya lang, mahaba na yung proseso only because pag file mo, dapat lahat nakaayos na yung ebidensya. Which is only but right, no? Ang, ang effect naman ngayon, paano yung defendant? Eh, of course, the, the plaintiff has, you know, has a long period of time. Basta ba nasa prescriptive period pa yan, no? If in the period, it can take sweet time, okay? Pwede siya ma-prepare yung complaint of JA na what, more than two months. How about the defendant? Technically, the defendant under the new rules now is given a longer period of time within which to file an answer, okay? to the complaint. Hindi katulad noon 15, ngayon 30 calendar days. Okay. And in fact, it is only in, it, the general rule is you're no longer allowed to file a motion for extension of time to file a pleading, except in an answer. Okay. Except when you want to extend, the, to ask for additional period of time to file an answer, you can be given an additional period of 30 days. So theoretically, you may have 60 days within which to file your answer and your judicial affidavits. Okay? Hanggang dun ang pinaka-max mo. Okay, now. Okay, so we're done with Rule 7. Okay. Time check, it's, on, it's already 3 o'clock. Okay, 3 o'clock. Siguro mga bandang 3.30, I will stop so that we can have a five-minute break. Kasi syempre nosebleed masyado yung pinag-uusapan natin. So, medyo at 3.30, let's compose ourselves again, let's go back, let's drink, and then I will come back to continue. Okay. Now, let me now go to Rule 8. Okay? Okay. Yung answer sa JA, kailangan na rin i-attach. I'm sorry, I saw a comment here. Yes, the answer to the answer of the defendant, in the, the answer, the, the JA, or the JA of the defendant's witnesses should likewise be attached to the answer. Okay. Section 1, Rule 8. Every pleading shall contain in a methodical and logical form a plain, concise, and direct statement of the ultimate facts, including the evidence on which the party relies for his or her claim or defense as the case may be. Okay. The second paragraph was amended. If a cause of action or defense relied on is based on law, the pertinent provisions thereof and their applicability to him or her shall be clearly and concisely stated. Okay. You know, under Section 1 of Rule 8 of the 1997 Rules, it is only when the defense is based on law that you are required to quote the pertinent provision of law. Now, the, um, the Section 1, Paragraph 2 was amend amended to the effect to include now that if your complaint or cause of action rather is based on law, you cite the pertinent provision of law, which I think is also correct. No? Okay. Section two, no changes, and that's your alternative causes of action. Your conditions precedent, no changes. Section four, incapacity, no changes. Same with section five. Okay. Now let me now go to judgment section six. 
in pleading a judgment or decision of a domestic or foreign court, judicial or quasi-judicial, okay, of tribunal or a board of officer, it is sufficient to avert the judgment or decision without setting forth showing jurisdiction to render it. Okay. Why? Because precisely jurisdiction is presumed, no? An authenticated copy of the judgment or decision shall be attached to the pleading now. I draw your attention to Section 6, Rule 8, which now, uh, Section 6, Rule 8, which now requires that an authenticated copy of the judgment or decision shall be attached to the pleading. I might as well bring to the attention of the listeners that it need not be consularized anymore, okay? Kasi being a mem be the Philippines being a member of the Hague Convention, abolishing the requirement of a legalization for foreign public documents, pwede na lang i-apostilize. Hindi na tayo pupunta sa consular office at kumuha nung, para kumuha ba ng red ribbon, okay? Pwede ka na lang magpa-apostilize. Okay, now. Uh, section 7, actually this one is action or defense based on an actionable document, hindi yan nagbago, okay? It should be attached. And how to contest such documents, hindi rin nagbago. But the way you contest an actionable document, of course, is you have to deny under oath the due execution and authenticity of the said document. You don't deny under oath, then they, it will give rise to a technical admission. Section 9, no change. Section 10, specific denial, okay, except um, gender inclusiveness provisions, no change. Now, allegations not specifically denied, deemed admitted. If you read, and this is very short lang naman, may I ask you to just read Section 11. In Section 11 of Rule 8 of the 1997 rules, the material averments that are deemed admitted are those stated in the complaint, okay? The amendment, okay, in section 11 appears to be more inclusive and appropriate as it may now include material averments in a third party complaint or even in an answer where a permissive counterclaim is being asserted. Okay, okay. Siguro ganito, kasi itong section 12, how would I put it? Basta ma, ano siya, kakaiba siya. Okay? So, can we have just a one-minute break? Uh, let's call on the Holy Spirit. Okay? Na medyo paliwanagin ng ating isip para pagbalik natin sa section 12, we have a new, uh, we are, our minds are clear because this section 12, as I said, is very, very different. Okay? Can I, let's just have a one-minute break. Sandali lang po. Okay, dun mo sa mga nagtatanong, what we will do is we will um, we will collate them, okay? Pagkatapos po sa susunod na session, dun po natin sasagutin. Ano po? Okay. Sige po. Okay. So let's start with section 12. Affirmative defenses. A defense, a defendant shall raise his or her affirmative defenses in his or her answer which shall be limited to the reasons set forth under Section 5B, Rule 6, and the following grounds. Okay. First ground, that the court has no jurisdiction over the person of the defending party. The venue is improperly laid. Three, the plaintiff has no legal capacity to sue. Four, that the pleading asserting the claim states no cause of action and that a condition preceded for the filing of the claim has not been complied with. Now, so from actually yung 5B Rule 6 at saka itong mga in-enumerate, yan daw pwede nyo erase by way of affirmative defenses. Okay. 
failure to raise the affirmative defenses at the earliest opportunity shall constitute a waiver thereof. The court shall muto proprio resolve the above affirmative defenses within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer. As to the other affirmative defenses under the first paragraph of section 5B, okay, rule six, the court may conduct a summary hearing within 15 calendar days from the filing of the answer. Such affirmative defenses shall be resolved by the court within 30 calendar days from the termination of the summary hearing. Okay. Affirmative defenses, if denied, shall not be subject of a motion for recon or petition for certiorari, prohibition, or mandamus, okay, but may be, among others, to be raised on appeal after judgment on the merits. This is a new provision, okay, and let me discuss my understanding of it to you, okay, now. Okay, the defendant must file an answer and raise all the grounds mentioned in section 5C rule 6, okay, and those enumerated under section 12 by way of affirmative defenses. Ano ba yung grounds under 5, 6, rule 6 of the 2019 rules? Number one, fraud, statute of limitations, release, payment, illegality, statute of frauds, estoppel, former recovery, discharge in bankruptcy, and any other matter by way of confession and avoidance. Pag yan daw ang in-raise nyo, hindi nyo yan marireise sa motion to dismiss. Unang-una, wala na yung Rule 16. Okay? Hindi daw. Marireise lamang nyo yan sa inyong answer by way of affirmative defense. You may also, in the, in the answer, include the following affirmative defenses. Okay? Court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. Litis pendentia, res judicata, and prescription of action. Okay. And of course, your grounds mentioned under Section 12, Rule 8, yung no jurisdiction over the person of the defending party, venue improperly laid, plaintiff has no legal capacity to sue, pleading, uh, pleading asserting the claim states no cause of action, and that a condition precedent for filing the claim has not been complied with. In my mind, there are therefore three groups which you can raise by way of affirmative defense. The first group is composed of the grounds mentioned under 5C Rule 6. Okay, that's the first ground. The second ground actually are the grounds, okay, yung tinatawag kong apat na sikat, Section 1, Rule 9. Lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, litis pendentia, res judicata, prescription. Okay. At saka yung third group will be your Section 12, Rule 8 yung lack of jurisdiction over the person of the defending party, when improper delay, etc. Okay. Please take note, okay, that under Rule 9, okay, Rule 9, I'm sorry, Rule 15, Section 12 of the 2019 rules, okay, yun sa mga sinabi kong affirmative defenses, there are four affirmative defenses which you can raise, okay, in a motion to dismiss. Pursuant to Rule 15, Section 12. At ano ano yon? Court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. Litis pendentia, res judicata, and prescription of uh, by statute of limitations. Okay, now. When we discuss Rule 15, Okay, notice, okay, sa Rule 15, sa Rule 16, tinanggal na yan, yung mga grounds yan, i-raise mo by way of affirmative defense. Okay, what will be the action of the court? Kailangan mo pa ba mag-file ng motion to hear, motion for preliminary hearing to hear the affirmative defenses? The answer is no. Okay, that, that actually is in your Rule 16, but that was taken out. Okay, and number two, under Rule 15 of the 2019 rules, that is a prohibited pleading. So, paano magiging action ngayon ng korte? Okay, the action of the court will depend on what affirmative defense you raise. Okay, if the affirmative defense is any of the grounds mentioned in Section 12, Rule 8, okay, 
And what are the grounds mentioned under Section 12, Rule 8? Okay. Again, when the court has no jurisdiction over the person of the defending party, venue improperly late, plaintiff has no legal capacity to sue, pleading asserting the claim states no cause of action, that a condition precedent for filing the claim has not been complied with, anong magiging action ng court doon? Then the court shall on its own resolve the affirmative defense within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer. Okay. Hindi na kailangan magkaroon pa ng hearing dyan. The court on its own can file, okay? Can, um, can decide on its own. And in fact, it is required to decide it within 30 calendar days from the filing of the answer. Now, if the affirmative defense is any one of the grounds mentioned under the first paragraph of Section B, 5B, Rule 6, okay? At again, ano yung mga grounds na yun? Fraud, statute of limitations, release, payment, illegality, statute of uh, estoppel, former recovery, discharge in bankruptcy, and uh, any other matter by way of confession and avoidance. Ano ang maggagawin ng korte? The court on its own discretion okay, may conduct a summary hearing within 15 calendar days from the filing of the answer. Such affirmative defenses will be resolved by the court within 30 calendar days from the termination of the summary hearing. In other words, depende sa ni-raise mong affirmative defenses, yung magiging basihan ng action ng court. Okay. If the affirmative defenses you raise, okay, are those mentioned under um, Section 12, Rule 8, hindi na kailangan magkaroon ng preliminary hearing on the affirmative defense because the court on its own can resolve the matter. But if your ground are, is one of those mentioned under section, um, section, section 6, okay, court, okay, then the court may conduct a preliminary hearing on it, okay? And then the court will decide the, whether the affirmative defense should be granted or not, okay, within a period of 30 days from the termination of that summary hearing. Okay. Now, bakit ganun ang treatment? How come do sa isang group, yung court on its own, without a need for a summary hearing can resolve, but on the other group, okay, the court may conduct a summary hearing. The difference in treatment lies on the fact that the affirmative defenses mentioned in Section 5B, Rule 6, may require presentation of evidence, alunde in support thereof. Of course, except, except of lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter. Okay, now. Okay. Now what happens, for example, if the affirmative, okay, kung yung affirmative defense denied, okay, Notice, you cannot file a motion for recon on the said denial of your affirmative defenses. And you are barred from even elevating the order, okay, denying your motion for recon via certiorari prohibition or mandamus. You are likewise barred, okay, from filing or elevating the denial of the order or the order denying your affirmative defenses to what? To the CA via appeal, for example. Why? Because that's an interlocutory order. Okay. So what is your remedy kung yung affirmative defense mo ay uh, dininay? Okay. Then you go to trial. And in the event of an adverse judgment, okay, you now appeal the said judgment and and assign as one of the errors in the appeal the order of the denial of your affirmative defense. Okay. Now, may nagtanong sa akin noon, okay, paano kung yung affirmative defense, okay, ay ground na lack of jurisdiction over the person of the defendant? In other words, improper service of summons, okay? Tapos dininay. E di sabi, di ba, hindi mo siya pwede i-appeal. Hindi ka pwede mag-MR dun sa order denying that affirmative offense. Defense, hindi ka rin pwede tumakyat via certiorari. Mag, sabi, tumiridiretso ka daw ng trial, tapos mag-appeal ka na lang. 
would that not tantamount to voluntary submission? I think in that case, you should be very consistent when you participate in the court proceedings, that this is without prejudice to your right to question it so that you will not be considered as having been stopped okay, from raising that defense. Because the, the rule is very clear. You really cannot file a motion for the consideration against the, or, against the order denying your affirmative defense. Okay. Of course, if the court grants the affirmative defense, the order is no longer interlocutory. That's a final order as it is, there's nothing left else left to be resolved thereafter. So proceeding from that premise that it is a final order, then the plaintiff's remedy is to appeal the court's order granting the affirmative defense. Okay? Clear. And that's a case of Nuke versus Aquino. Uh, it's a 2015 case. Okay. Now. Okay. Now let's go to section 13. Wala namang pagbabago dyan. Okay. Rule 9. Rule 9, effect of failure to plead, okay? Okay. Defenses and objections not pleaded, pleaded either in a motion to dismiss or in the answer are deemed waived. However, where, when it appears from the pleadings or the evidence on record that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter, okay, that there is another action pending between the same parties for the same cause, or that the action is barred by a prior judgment or by statute of limitations, the court shall dismiss the claim. Okay, let me just focus on this section one. Okay. As a rule, pursuant to section 12A of rule 15 of the 2019 Rules on Civil Procedure, a motion to dismiss is a prohibited pleading. Okay, it is a, it is a prohibited pleading. That's the general rule. Wala nang motion to dismiss. Except when the motion to dismiss, pursuant to the same rule, is grounded on the following, that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter of the claim, litis prudentia, res judicata, and description of action. Okay. Okay. And statute of limitations. Okay. Now. With the deletion of Section 1, Rule 6, that tanggal na yung Rule 16, di ba? Sinabi ko kanina, tanggal na siya. Okay. The question is, what is the period of time within which to file a motion to dismiss? Kung natatandaan natin yung Rule 16, as it's currently worded now, you file a motion to dismiss within the period for you to file a responsive pleading. Remember, the entire Rule 16 was now taken out. So ang tanong natin, kailan tayo pwede mag-file ng motion to dismiss? I think even if, okay, that was already taken out, you should file your motion to dismiss, okay, as a general rule within the period to file an answer, which means within 30 days, okay? Bakit? Kasi kung hindi ka mag-file ng motion to dismiss, hindi ka nag-file ng answer, mag-declare ka naman in default. Okay, now. But there is a case, okay, and this is the case of um, Panganiban versus Filipina Shell. It's a 2003 case. The requirement that a motion to dismiss should be filed within the time for filing the answer is not absolute, okay? Even, uh, if, even after an answer has been filed, a defendant can still file a motion to dismiss on the following grounds. Lack of jurisdiction, latest pendentia, lack of cause of action, and discovery during trial of evidence that would constitute a ground of dismissal. Okay, now. Okay. So, but so as I said, the general rule, even if you can file a motion to dismiss based on those four grounds, you can only do that, okay, within the period to file a responsive pleading, or again, based on the jurisprudence, Panganiban versus Pilipina Shell, you can do that after, even after the filing of the complaint. Okay. Okay, section two, compulsory counterclaim or cross claim not set up barred in the no changes, okay? And then default, okay? Let me just discuss sections three, okay? Section three, okay, yung default na yan, okay? Even if walang pagbabago, but let me just discuss it, okay? When you fail to file, okay, when you fail to file your answer against a complaint within the period, 
the defendant may the plaintiff rather may file a motion to declare you in default. Okay. And if you file a motion to declare defendant in default, ang titig lang lang naman dyan, kailan synergy summons, kailan natanggap. No? Pangalawa, okay, uh, nakapag ng answer. If you were, if you Receive the sum if you were properly served summons and you failed to file an answer. Okay, what is the next move of the plaintiff is to file a motion to declare you in default. So if you were properly declared in default, what will be your remedies? Okay, within the period, okay, basta before judgment by default, you can file a motion to set aside order of default, which is supposed to be verified based on fraud, accident, mistake, or excusable negligence. And of course, you have to attach your affidavit of merit. Okay. Pag nakuha mo na yung judgment by default, ano naman yung iyong, um, ano ang iyong remedies? Okay. Within the period to file an appeal, you can file a motion for recon, you can file a motion for your new trial, you can even file an appeal. E natapos, hindi mo pa rin nagawa. Okay. For reasons not attributable to you, ha? I have to stress that. Okay. Now, ano ang remedy mo? You can file a Rule 38, Petition for Relief from Judgment. And again, based off on fame and affidavit, affidavit of merit. Okay. Pero please take file a petition for relief from judgment, okay? You better make sure that you will be able to explain to the court why you're not able to avail of a motion to set aside order of default because this is already a remedy in equity, okay? So those are the remedies. Can you consider Rule 47 a remedy? My submission is yes, which is a petition for annulment of judgment. But Notice that the petition for annulment of judgment under Rule 47 is very specific as to the ground. In the thing, it's just fraud, extrinsic fraud. Tula din ang extrinsic na fraud sa petition for relief of judgment and motion to set aside order. Okay. Those will be your remedies if you were properly declared in default. But what if, if you were improperly declared in default? Well, the case of Indiana Aerospace says, okay, teaches us that the remedy is you file a motion for reconsideration and if it's denied, then you go up on certiorari, okay, according to the case of Indiana Aerospace, okay. Pag binit na declare ka bang in default, okay, pag na declare ka bang in default, pwede ba kung magkano na lang ang bigay sa iyo ng korte, okay, the answer is no. Why? Because according to the rules, okay, a party declared in default, okay, yes, you're not entitled to participate anymore, but you are entitled to notices, okay? And what can be the, um, the what should we call this, the extent of relief to be awarded? It can be a judgment rendered against a party in default shall neither exceed the amount or be different in kind from that prayed for. Ang prayer mo, specific performance, tapos ang binigla namang ginawa ng court, inanal yung agreement. Okay. A specific performance yung agreement ang gusto mong relief. At hindi pwedeng magbigay or award unliquidated damages. So hindi pwede mag-award ng moral damages, exemplary damages, because that is what is under the law. Okay. Now, um, there can be no default. Okay, what happens, for example, if a plaintiff sues three defendants based on the same cause of action. Defendant A filed an answer, B and C did not. Can B and C be declared in default? The answer is no. Because they are sued on the same cause of action, the, def the answering defendant's answer will inure to the benefit of the non-answering non defendant. They will not, that these two did not answer, will not be declared in default. There can also be no declaration on default, okay, in actions for petition for annulment of marriage, petition for declaration of nullity of marriage, and of course, for petitions for legal separation. Okay. Now, now let's go to Rule 10, amend, amended and supplemental pleadings. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, rule 10. Amendments in general. Pleadings may be amended by adding or striking out name of any party or by correcting a mistake in the name of a party or a mistaken or, or inadequate allegation or description in any other respect so that actual merits of the controversy may be speedily be determined without regard to technicalities in the most expeditious and expensive manner. No change as far as section one is concerned. Section two, amendments as a matter of right. A party may amend this pleading once as a matter of right at any time before a responsive pleading is served or in the case of a reply at any time within 10 calendar days after it's served. As I said, ito yung isang example ng ang amendment lamang ay instead of 10 days, 10 calendar days. Okay. Now let's go to section 3. Diyan merong amendment. Okay. Except as provided in the next preceding section, which is, okay. Substantial amendments may be made only upon leave of court. But such a leave shall be refused if it appears to the court that the motion was made with intent to delay or the conferred jurisdiction on the court or the pleading stated no cause of action from the beginning which could be amended. Okay. Orders of the court upon matters provided in the section shall be made upon motion filed in court and after notice to the adverse party and an opportunity to be heard. Okay, now. My comment only. Okay. A party may amend his pleading once as a matter of right. Okay, once as a matter of right at any time before a responsive pleading is served. But the court may, upon motion at any stage of the action and upon such terms as may be just, order to give leave to a party to amend this pleading to the end that the real matter in dispute and all matters in the action in dispute between the parties may be completely determined in a single proceeding. Even after an order dismissing his complaint is issued, an amended amendment may still be allowed. The motion to amend should be filed before the order of dismissal becomes final and unappealable because thereafter there would be nothing more to amend. That is Constantino versus Reyes. Okay. Now, but I have lang a question, no? Kasi nakalagay sa section 3, except as provided in the next preceding section which means amendments, okay, as a matter of right, except that, okay. Substantial amendments may be made only upon leave of court, but such leave shall be refused if it appears to the court that the motion was meant with intent to delay or confer on the court jurisdiction or the pleading stated no cause of action. So I filed, okay, I filed. I filed, let's say, uh, a complaint. Yung complaint, ang nakalagay, collection suit, Ang complaint, ang nakalagay, ito final ko sa RTC. Ang amount ng complaint, let's say, is 300,000 pesos o 250,000 pesos. Final ko sa RTC. Di ba sobrang mali yun? Kasi walang jurisdiction naman ng RTC to hear and decide complaints involving a collection suit of 250. And then I realized na kamali ako. Okay. Sabi, ito ha, I'm just re re reading section 3 except as provided in the next preceding section, which is what? Amendments as a matter of right. It would appear I can amend. Diba? I can amend to the end that I will now amend to confer jurisdiction to the court. But if I filed a mo an answer and there is now, I'm sorry, if I filed a complaint and now there is now an answer and the answer raises okay, an affirmative defense that is, that the court has no jurisdiction over the subject matter. Kahit na walang affirmative defense. Why? Because a court on its own can dismiss the complaint. Look at, your, look at this part of section 3. Okay? But such leave shall be refused. Shall be refused. If it appears to the court that the motion was made with intent to delay or confer jurisdiction on the court or the pleading stated no cause of action from the beginning which could be amended. So my question actually in my mind is this. If I filed a complaint and the complaint fails, does not state a cause of action, okay? Or stated no cause of action. Or that the court has no jurisdiction to entertain my complaint. If I'm going to file or amend my complaint as a matter of right, mukha, based if you read section 2 and 3, mukhang pwede. 
But if you are going to amend your complaint no longer as a matter of right, but by leave of court, hindi ako po pwede because it's very clear here that the leave shall be refused if it appears to the court that the motion was made with intent to delay or confer jurisdiction on the court or the pleading stated no cause of action from the beginning which could be amended. Okay. Okay, section four, nothing new. Okay, nothing new. Okay. Section five. Section 5, no amendment necessary to conform to authorized presentation of evidence. When issues not raised in the pleadings are tried with the express or implied consent of the parties, okay, they shall be treated in all respects as if they had been raised in the pleadings. No amendment of such pleadings deemed amended is necessary to cause them to conform to the evidence. Actually, that is Juris, that is based on jurisprudence. Anong ibig sabihin nyo? Kunwari, sa complaint ko, I did not raise the issue of moral damages. Okay. Di siyempre sa answer, wala rin na moral damages. Nag-pre-trial ngayon kami. Wala rin dun sa pre-trial order yung issue ng sino ba moral damages. But nung nag-present na ako ng ebidensya, I presented a witness for the purpose of proving moral damages. Walang objection yung kabila. Ganun din naman yung kabila. Okay? Now, because it was an issue that was not generated by the pleadings, nor was it an issue that was stated in the pre-trial order, but was expressly tried on by the parties. Okay? Pumasok na yung ebidensya. Do I have to file a motion? Okay? to motion to amend my complaint, okay, in order to conform with the evidence presented? The answer is no. It is not fatal, in other words, if you don't move to have your pleadings amended to conform with the evidence presented. Okay. Supplemental pleadings, okay, wala naman din masyadong pagbabago, paglilinaw lang, gender inclusiveness, and 10 calendar days, okay? Okay. You, in other words, the adverse party may plead there too within 10 calendar days from notice of the order admitting the supplemental pleading. Filing of amended pleading, okay, no change. Effect of amended pleading, okay. And the amendment here really conforms to evidence. Okay, let me just read first section eight to you. An amended pleading supersedes, okay, the pleading that it amends. However, admissions in superseded pleadings may be offered in evidence against the pleader in claims or defenses alleged therein not incorporated in the amended pleading shall be deemed waived. Okay. As I said earlier, this amendment actually incorporates only the teaching by the Supreme Court. In the case of Ching versus CA, okay, under the rules pleading superseded or amended disappear technically from the records. And what do I mean by disappear? They lose their status as pleadings and they cease to be judicial admissions. They no longer form part of the records of the case. Why? Because when you amend a pleading, that original, that original pleading is deemed vacated. Okay. While, may, while they may nonetheless be utilized against the pleader as extrajudicial admissions, they must, in order to have said effect, be formally offered in evidence. Pwede yung gamitin as evidence, pero kailangan mo yun i-offer in evidence. In other words, kailangan mo ibalik sa records uh, through a formal offer of evidence. Okay? Which means I have to call a witness to identify that document. Okay? And then, and offer it sa formal offer of evidence at sabihin ng kote, okay, admitted. Consequently, if the, there is now an admission, the original complaint having been amended lost its character as a judicial admission which would have required no proof and became merely an extrajudicial admission, the admissibility of which as evidence required its formal proof. Okay, clear. Okay. Section 11. Okay, when to file pleadings. Okay, this is what I'll do. I will just uh, summarize, okay, summarize lang natin yung section 11. Okay, 
if the answer to be filed is if, if the pleading to be filed is an answer, okay, you have a period of 30 calendar days from personal service or substituted service of summons, okay, within which to file your answer unless a different time is fixed by the court. That is on the basis of, uh, that's the same period for answers to third party complaints. Okay. Okay, there, my question lang, sorry ha, may napansin lang ako. Uh, may motion to dismiss. Yung may nagtanong, yung remaining period, these five periods, I will discuss that when we hit motion to dismiss. Huh? So not, not muna. I, I, but I will answer that question. Okay. Now, how many days are you supposed to file an answer if the defendant is a foreign juridical entity? Now, if someone's was served, let's say, on a resident agent of that foreign juridical entity, it's 30 days. But if the summons to that foreign juridical, foreign juridical entity, okay, was served, okay, was given, let's say, on a government official designated to the said defendant, then the the answer should be filed within six days, calendar days, from receipt thereof. Okay. How about an answer to an amended complaint? Okay, when an amended complaint was filed as a matter of right, then the answer to the amended complaint that was filed as a matter of right should be 30 calendar days from service of summons. However, when the amended complaint was not filed as a matter of right, which means an answer had already been filed, okay, you want to file an amended answer to the amended complaint, you are given a period of 15 calendar days from notice of the order admitting the same. Please take note that when an answer had already been filed to the complaint and the complaint was no longer as a matter of even if you did not file an answer to the said amended complaint, you will not be declared in default. The answer to the original complaint you filed will stand as your answer to the amended complaint. However, all the matters that you did not address in the amended complaint will be deemed admitted. Okay. Now, what is the period to file an answer to a supplemental complaint? Okay. The period is within 20 calendar days from notice of the order admitting the same unless a different period was fixed by the court. Okay. Now again, the answer to the complaint shall be served as the answer to your supplemental complaint if no new supplemental answer was filed. Okay. Now how about, okay, answer. Answer to a compulsory or permissive counterclaim or cross-claim. You have a period of 20 calendar days, okay, within which to file your answer to either a compulsory or a permissive counterclaim. Remember, you don't file an answer to a compulsory counterclaim, okay lang yan. You don't file an answer to a permissive counterclaim, you're dead. Why? Because you can be declared in default. Okay. Reply. If reply is allowed under Section 10, Rule 6, and when will reply be allowed if the answer is founded on an actionable document, okay? You have a period of 15 calendar days from service of the pleading responded to to file the reply. Okay. Answer, answer to bill of particulars, okay? Before responding to a pleading, a party may move for a definite statement or, a, or for a bill of particulars. If Pleading is a reply, the motion must be filed within calendar days. Then if it's granted, your period to file an answer will be 10 days. Okay, now, how about if the summons was served by publication pursuant to sections 15, 16, 17, 18 of rule 14? Okay, ang summons pinablish, ilang araw ang pwede? Okay, mag-file. Okay. It should be 60 days after notice. Okay. Bakit hindi ko sinama yung section 14? Kasi sa section 14, walang nakalagay na period. 
Pero yung section 15, 16, 17, 18 ng rule 14, malinaw na may period. Okay. Now, answer in intervention. Okay. You file your answer in intervention to the complaint in intervention within 15 calendar days from notice of the order admitting the same, unless a different period was filed. Okay, I was stated by the court. Okay. Of course, the period to file an answer to, let's say, a complaint filed under the rules on summary procedure is 10, and the response to uh, small claims will also be 10. Okay, may ilang nagtatanong, okay? Sabi ganito daw, okay? Okay. Remember that a motion to dismiss, the only way you can file a motion to dismiss under the 2019 rules, kung ang motion to dismiss mo is predicated of, on the four grounds. Lack of jurisdiction over the subject matter, dispendensya, res judicata, and prescription. Let's assume dinginay. Okay. Ilan daw yung period to file an answer? Remember that the entire of Rule 16 was deleted. Wala na siya talaga. Wala na, wala na. Doon sa Rule 16, doon nakalagay, yung Rule 16 na natanggal na, no? nakalagay doon, you have the remaining period of time, but not less than five days within which to file an answer should your motion to dismiss be denied. Okay? Or is denied. E natanggal na nga yung provision na yun. So, ano na yung period mo within which to file an answer? This is my personal take on it. You only have the remaining period within which to file an answer. Wala na yung in no case, in no instance, will be not less than five days. Wala na yung. You only have the remaining period. Therefore, if you filed your motion to dismiss on the 30th day, okay, deny. technically you have only one day to file an answer. But remember, under the rules, you can file a motion for an extension of time once, okay, if you're going to ask for an extension of time to file an answer. So, anong remedy dapat dyan? Dapat siguro in practice. Huwag nating hintayin naman ng 30 days doon ka mag-file ng motion to dismiss mo. Pwede mong i-file. Ano ba naman yung 15 days? Be mag-file ka ng motion to dismiss ng 15 days, okay? Para pag na you have the remaining period of 15 days. Plus, kung hindi pa sufficient ka to file an answer, as I said, the rules will allow you to file a motion for extension of time to file an answer within a period of 30 days. So technically, you have 45 days okay, within which to file an answer. Kaya siguro tininggal yung provision na yun. Kasi, i-file mo lang yung motion to dismiss mo, ang haba ng period eh. Kung ipa-file mo early. Now, you, you, you will suffer the consequences if you file it on the last day Dahil ang ginagawa mo dyan, yung motion to dismiss mo, imagine sinagawa mo. Huwag mong sagarin yung 30 days para may sufficient period of time pa. Okay. Now, now section 2, okay, uh, I, as I've said, no, um, I discussed the period of time in, uh, I summarized the period of time, so I will now move on to, section, to rule 12. Okay? Okay, one minute. Rule 12, before responding to a pleading, a party may move for a definite statement or for a bill of particulars of any matter which is not a bird with sufficient definite or particularity to enable him or her properly to prepare his or her responsive pleading. If the motion, if the pleading is a reply, the motion must be filed within 10 calendar days from service thereof. Such motion should point out the defects complained of, the paragraphs wherein they are constrained, contained, and the details desired. The only change there is refer to gender inclusiveness. Okay. Now, action the, by the court, no change. So section two on bill of particulars, still the same. Same with section three. Okay. And also with section four. Actually, sa bill of particulars, talaga wala pang as is. Now, let us now go to filing and service of pleadings. Okay. Tandaan natin, pag sinabi yung word na, okay, yung verb na file, file, file in court. Okay. Serve, yung verb na yan, you associate it with the other party. So you serve first to the other party and then file in court the pleading. Okay. 
now. Section one, in, mas lumawak at mas naging mas malinaw because section now one provides this rule shall govern the filing of all pleadings. Now it includes motions and other court submissions as well as their service except those for which a different mode of service is prescribed. Okay, okay. now section two. Okay, and this is important. Filing is the act of submitting the pleading or other paper to the court. Service is the act of providing a party with a copy of the pleading or any other court submission. If a party has appeared by counsel, service upon such party shall be made upon his or her counsel unless service upon the party in the party's counsel is ordered by the court. So general rule, you appear through counsel, everything will be reckoned from the receipt of the counsel. At dun dun sa counsel, dun 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 ka magsiserve. Okay. Where one party, where one counsel appears for several parties, such counsel shall only be entitled to one copy of any paper served by the opposite side. Where several counsels appear for one party, such party shall be entitled to only one copy of any pleading or paper to be served upon the lead counsel if one is designated or upon any one of them, if there is no designation of a lead counsel. Maganda itong amendment na to, lalong-lalo na if you have a battery of lawyers. Tama lang naman na sabihin sa korte, sino dito sa mga abogado ng plaintiff ang lead counsel? Okay, bakit? Kasi pag na-designate na yung lead counsel, okay, isa lang yung bibigyan mo ng, he is the only one entitled to receive a copy of everything. Okay? Sa kanya din magsisimula yung bilangan. Kunwari, mag-file ng appeal. Sa kanya magbibilang kasi siya yung lead. Ang mahirap, marami kayong abogado, let's say for the defendant, walang na-designate na lead counsel, magtatawagan pa kayo, sino, natanggap mo na ba, natanggap mo na ba? Kasi ang, ang rule na mangyari, kung sino una nakatanggap, dyan magsisimula yung bilang kung kailangan mo kunwari mag -appeal. So this one actually is a very good amendment because now it's very clear that for purposes of orderliness and case management, the lead counsel should be identified. Okay, So without a lead counsel being designated as held in the case of Philippine Ports Authority versus Sargasso Construction, notice to any one of the several councils on record is equivalent to notice to all. And such notice starts the time running for appeal notwithstanding that the other counsel on record has not received a copy of the decision. Okay, now section three. Okay, the filing of pleadings and other court submissions, which will include your motions, shall be made A, submitting personally the original there. Filing in court. How do you do that? Personally, sabi sa A. B, sending them by registered mail. That's the second. Third, sending them by accredited courier. You know, your private courier, tulad ng LBC, kunwari. Kung accredited siya court, ha? Transmitting them by electronic mail or other electronic means as may be authorized by the court in places where the court is electronically equipped. Okay. In the first case, the clerk of court shall endorse on the pleading the hour and the date, the date and hour of filing. In the second and third cases, the date of motions, pleadings, and other court submissions, and payments or deposit as shown by the post office stamp on the envelope or the registry receipt shall be considered as the date of their filing, payment, or deposit. The envelope should be attached to the record of the case. In the fourth case, the date of the electronic transmission should be considered as date of filing. Okay. So based on the amendment, what are the different modes of filing in court? Number one, personal. Okay. Number two, registered mail. Pwede private courier, but the private courier must be accredited by the court. Dapat siya, nuhihingi ka ng listahan sa korte, sino ba accredited private courier? Hindi porke malaki yung private courier at kilala, ayan, automatically, video natin ipadala. Tignan nyo muna kung siya ay accredited ng korte. At itong huli, with prior approval of the court, you can do your filing via electronic mail. 
Pero ang importante sa electronic mail ito, it has to be with prior approval of the court. And the court must be in a place where the court is electronically equipped. Okay? Dapat ang court electronically equipped tumanggap ng electronic filing. So ang tanong dyan, okay, pwede ko ba, okay, serve ko yung kopya dun sa kabila, let's say personal, eh hindi ako aabot sa korte. Pwede ko bang iserve via Viber? Iserve via Facebook? Kasi electronic naman din yun. Diba? Pwede ba yun? Ito ang aking sariling opinion. Okay. Ang sinasabi, yung court electronically equipped. Hindi yung staff ng court na may Viber o na may Facebook, siya kung, pwede, kung meron siya, ibig sabihin pwede ka na mag-file. Okay, no. It is the court that should be electronically equipped. But most important, you can only do electronic filing if you were able to obtain the prior approvals of the court. Okay. Now, there's a question here. Who, who will accredit the couriers? I think it will be the Supreme Court. Para lahat pare-pareho. No? Okay. I think. Now, the second paragraph of Section 1, Rule 13, 29. Okay. May, may I refer you again to the second paragraph? Kasi may tanong din ako dito. I hope you don't understand, I, I hope you understand that sometimes I would like to voice also my questions because uh, this is the first time, of course, that we're discussing the rules and it's still, you know, we need guidance from the Supreme Court and of course it will take some time before siguro a case will be decided by the Supreme Court involving these provisions. Kaya lang kasi dito sa second paragraph of Rule 3, and I will repeat it, no? In the first case, the clerk of court shall endorse on the pleading the date and hour of the filing. Okay. Second and third cases, at ano ba yung second and third? Third mail and sending them by accredited courier. Listen carefully. The date of the mailing of the motions, pleadings, and other court submissions and payments or deposits as shown by the post office stamped on the envelope or the registry receipt shall be considered as the date of their filing. Ang nag issue lang, okay, ng post office stamp at ng registry receipt is if you filed it by registered mail. So if you read the second paragraph, the second sentence of the second paragraph, the date of filing, when is, when is the pleading deemed filed if it was filed through private courier, okay? Hindi nakalagay dito sa second paragraph, okay, of the rule. Why? Because the second sentence, even if it says in the second and third cases, the following phrases, the, the remainder of the sentence would refer only to the second mode of filing, which is by registered mail. So in my mind, again, I ask the question, will the ruling in the case of heirs of Numeriano versus Miranda still apply? And what is the ruling? The date of delivery of pleadings to a private letter forwarding, forwarding agency is not to be considered as the date of filing thereof in court, instead the date of actual receipt by the court. Okay, is deemed the memo of filing of that pleading. Okay, hindi katulad kasi nung, okay, we go back to the second. If I filed it by, red, by personal, kung kailan tinanggap ng clerk of court, yun ang date of filing. Pag sinend ko by registered mail, okay, ang date of filing ko is kung kailan natanggap, okay, nung post office, okay, as shown by the post office stamp on the envelope or registry. Pero pagdating sa private courier, ano ang, deemed, ano ang araw na deemed filed ito? Hindi naman na ilagay. Okay. Now, the last, the last one is in the fourth case, the date of electronic transmission shall be the date considered as the date of filing. Ano ba yung date of transmission? Kung kailan mo pinundot yung send. Kaya very important, I think, in practice. Dapat wag natin i- buburahin yung yung bang sa send box okay dapat ka kukuna ng picture yon para merong kang record kung kailan mo pinadala because that will be your proof of the date of filing 
is the date of electronic transmission. Okay? Okay, now, in section four, okay? Uh, my question, Dito, do we have a definition for electronically equipped based on the rules? There's no definition as to what, when can you consider a port electronically equipped, okay? Section four, every judgment resolution complaint retention disappearance demand of judgment be filed upon the parties affected. Okay, no change in section four. Okay. Section five, codes of service. Okay. Pleadings, motions, notices, orders, judgments, and other court submissions shall be served personally or by registered mail, accredited courier, electronic mail, facsimile transmission, other electronic serve means as may be authorized by the court or as provided for international conventions to which the court, the Philippines, is a party. As I mentioned earlier, if we're talking about service, service to the adverse party. Okay. So what are the modes of serving a pleading, let's say, to the adverse party? You have personal service, you have registered mail, you have court accredited private courier, then you have your facsimile transmission, other electronic means, okay? But notice when you do facsimile transmission or electronic means or any electronic means, it has to be authorized by the court. Huh? As, and then of course, as may be provided for international conventions to which the Philippines is a party, and I will also include as a mode of serving a pleading, Section 8, Rule 13 of the 2019 Rules, Substituted Service of Pleadings. Okay. Can I also include ordinary mail pursuant to Section 7, Rule 13? Yes, if there is no registry. Okay, if there is no registry, um, if it cannot be served through registered mail, that is allowed under Section 7, Rule 13. Okay. I will repeat again, for purposes of facsimile transmission or other electronic means, and you have to serve it to the other party, it has to be with prior court approval, okay? And in fact, the parties must agree, as, I, it, as will be shown later, okay? Now, okay. Okay, there, I cannot help but look and see, I, I see, uh, what is the procedure for seeking prior court approval from the court? You just file, have to file a motion in court. And the court may treat it as a non litigious motion, okay? And the court can make a ruling on it. Just file a motion. Okay, okay section six, personal service. Court submissions may be served by personal delivery of a copy to the party or to the party's counsel or to their authorized representative named in the appropriate pleading or motion or by leaving it in his or her office with his or her clerk or with a person having charge thereof, okay? If no person is found in his, his or her office, his or her office is not known, or he or she has no office, then by leaving the copy between the hours of eight in the morning and six in the evening at the party's or council's residence. If known with a person of sufficient age and discretion residing therein, so what are the modes of personal service? Personally delivering of a copy to the party or the party's counsel or the authorized representative as mentioned in the pleading. Kung sa opisina ipapadala yung pleading, okay, dapat iwanan mo yan with a clerk or person in charge. Notice there is no time stated in the rules. But if there is no one is found in the office or if the office is unknown, or he has no office at all, then you leave between the hours of eight to five, okay? Eight in the morning and until five in the afternoon at the party or council's residence, if not, and you leave it with a person of sufficient age and discretion residing therein. Incidentally, okay, yung, um, yung rule 13, section 613, yung priority in service, Diba ang nakalagay doon sa current rules, no? 
Section 13, Rule 13, ang priority ng service is always, and filing is always personal. And you have to have a written explanation why you were not able to file and serve it personally. Yang requirement na yan, Section 13, Rule 13, ay wala na. Okay? Under the 29, 2019 rules, natanggal ho yung provision na yan. Okay. I do not know why. Maybe because if the court, if you can file, uh, what you might call this, if you can file uh, electronically and it was approved by the court and both parties agreed, kaya siguro hindi na kailangan. Okay. Now, Section 8, Substituted Service. Substituted service is different from substituted service of summons. Okay? Substituted service of pleadings. Requisites before substituted service can be resorted to. If you, if you read Section 8, you can have substituted service if there's failure to personally serve the pleading and failure to serve by registered mail. Since you serve your pleading sa kabila, walang tao dun yung pala out, wala na, okay? Hindi alam kung saan. Sinerve mo by registered mail, bumalik sa yon yung registered mail. Then service may be made by delivering the copy to the clerk of court with proof, okay, of failure of both personal service and service by mail. The service is complete at the time of such delivery. What does that mean? Ang clerk sa Section 8, bago ka mag-substituted service of summons. Ang kailangan lang, there's failure to serve it personally and by registered mail. Hindi mo kailangang pakita na even yung service by electronic, okay, eh failure. Hindi, hindi. Yung dalawa lang yun. Paid is personal service and by registered mail. Pag napakita mo na yun at may proof ka, then you go to court, Okay and you now file it with a clerk of court with proof of failure of both personal service and service by mail. The service of that pleading is complete at the time of such delivery. Okay, now, medyo sandali lang ha? I'm trying to catch my breath. Wait lang. Okay. Now, look at your section 9. Service by electronic means and facsimile. Nakakita pa ng fax machine. Okay? Kasi pagkaramihan ng opisina, wala ng fax machine. Okay? Now, service by electronic means and facsimile. Service by electronic means and facsimile shall be made if the party concerned consents to such mode of service. So aside from... Aside from it has to be approved by the court, the other party must give his or her consent. Service by electronic means shall be made by sending an email to the party or council's electronic mail address or through electronic means of transmission as the parties may agree on or upon discretion of the court. Service by facsimile shall be made by sending a facsimile copy to the parties or councils given facsimile, facsimile number. Okay. So the parties must agree, as I said, to have the pleading served either through facsimile or through electronic means. Okay. And please take note, it must likewise be authorized by the court pursuant to Section 5, Rule 13 of uh, the 2019 rules. Okay. Service by electronic means shall be made by sending an email to the party or council's electronic email address. Okay, let me just discuss this thing. We have our own personal email addresses. Okay. Sometimes uh, some law offices would even assign you your office email address. Now, and this is for the law firms to consider. If, let's say, you have many associates and you gave your associates uh, separate email, ano, uh, individual email addresses, and your associate now submits to the court the, let's say, the email address, kunwari, Pedro Santiago at uh, the law office, for example, is cruzlaw.com. Pag yan ang ibinigay mo, pag binigyan ka ng kopya ng kabila, 
yan ang gagamiting email address. Right? Okay. E paano ko nag-resign si, si associate? Tapos hindi, hindi naman alam ng court na nag-resign si associate. Tapos hindi nyo nasabi na, na dahil nag-resign na yan, doon pa rin at doon pupunta. Okay? Yung email na manggagaling doon sa kabila. So I think, I think, for again, for proper or uh, proper procedure, I think what you should give is the main, okay, email address of the law office, okay, which can be accessed by anybody. You can have one person designated as the email process, whatever person, who will be in charge of checking every day the emails and will be the one forwarding it to the different lawyers instead of allowing the associate to use his or her email address. Okay, baka magkagulo later on. Okay, now, as I said, okay, question, based on paragraph three, what if the parties agree? Okay, and then the court, can the court direct the service of pleadings be done through Facebook or Viber? Okay, that's a question just being posted. Okay, presumptive service. Okay, what is the mode of obtaining consent? You know, you find you can find a joint manifestation in court that you are agreeing that service between parties will have to be done electronically. Joint manifestation, you are correct. Okay. Okay. Presumptive service. There should be presumptive notice to a party of a court setting if such notice appears on the records to have been mailed at least 20 calendar days prior to the scheduled date of hearing. And if the addressee is from within the same judicial region of the court where the case is pending, or at least 30 calendar days if the addressee is from outside the judicial region. Okay, so that's a new provision. Let me just explain it. Okay, means an in practice. Okay, so I received, let's say, an order from the court. Lalo na ngayon, maraming cancellations of court because of COVID. So hindi naman kami nag-agree kung kailan yung hearing. So hihintayin namin yung court, sasabihin sa amin, kailan yung setting kasi na-cancel nga because of COVID. So nakatanggap ngayon ako, let's say, ng hearing, let's say, ng order from the court. Ang hearing daw namin is, is July 1. Okay. The court, okay, the court, let's say, is in Makati, RTC Makati. Ako, Makati. Kalaban ko, Makati. Pumunta ngayon ako ng July 1. Okay, na pumunta ako ng July 1. And then, the first thing I will do is go to, to the staff of the court and will ask for the record so that I will check kung, kung notified ba yung kalaban ko o hindi. Okay. And if I see that in the, in the there's a return that says, okay, na serve, okay? It says here that it appears from the records of the case that it has been mailed, okay, to my opposing counsel who is in Makati within at least 20 days prior July 1, okay, pag appear ko sa korte at hindi dumadating yung kalaban ko, pwede kong sabihin sa lalo kung bitbit ko yung witness, no? pwede kong sabihin sa korte, Your Honor, may I request that they are be allowed to present my witness because under Section 10 of the rule, okay, there is now a presumptive service of the hearing of the order setting the hearing today. Why? Because my opposing counsel, okay, it, it's shown that it was served 20 days prior to the scheduled date of hearing. And considering that the counsel, okay, is also within the same judicial region, holds office in the same judicial region where the court sits, okay, then may I be allowed to present my witness. That is presumptive service. Pero paano kunwari ang kalaban ko nakatira sa Baguio Okay. Eh, ang Baguio, hindi naman yan National Capital Judicial Region. Sa pagkaalam ko, it's the first judicial region. For the presumption to arise, okay, for me to be able to invoke presumptive service under Section 10, the order should have been made mailed at least 30 calendar days if the addressee is from, the, uh, from outside the judicial region. Okay. Again, this is very consistent with the with the reason, okay, behind the amendment to ensure that there will be no delay, okay? Kaya merong itong presumptive service, okay? Section 11, okay. A party who changes his or her electronic mail address or facsimile number 
Well, the action is pending, must promptly file within five calendar days from such change, a notice of change of email address or facsimile number with the court and serve the notice on all parties. Service through electronic mail or facsimile number of a party should be presumed valid unless such party notifies the court of any change as aforementioned. So like a change of address, you move your law office, you have to inform the court of your change of address. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Section 12. Electronic mail and facsimile subject and title of pleadings and other documents. The subject of electronic mail and facsimile must follow the prescribed form or form case number, case title, and the pleading order or document title. The title of each electronically filed or served pleading or other document and each submission served by the facsimile shall contain sufficient information to enable the court to ascertain from the title, the party or the parties filing or serving the paper, the nature of the paper, the party or parties against whom relief, if any, is sought, and the nature of the relief sought. In fact, my question is this, how do we do, if we want to file electronic, like we want to file electronic, electronically, let's say a reply, okay? Pag final yung reply, pwede ba, and then wala akong i-deny under oath. So wala kailangan yung denyan under oath. Ah, hindi pala ako pwede mag-file ng reply pala na. Kunwari, I will file, let's say, a memorandum, okay? I'll file a memorandum. Pwede ba yung memorandum, yun i-type ko na doon sa, sa electronic, electronic, doon sa mismong email, doon. I will follow everything from the caption to everything. Doon ko na kaagad i-type. Or is it going to be by way of attachment? Okay. One thing for sure, okay, one thing I'm sure is this, okay? What is required is an insufficient information. The nature of the paper, the party or parties against whom relief, if any, is sought, and the nature of the relief sought. Okay. You know, it, um, just by way of comment, because of this of the amendments introduced by the 2019 rules. Hindi lang, hindi lang. It's not only um, civil procedure, the teaching of civil procedure that will be affected. Even the feeding, even the forms, you know, hindi na tayo magpo-comply na ngayon sa ultimate facts, may evidentiary facts, at dapat kasama na doon yung judicial affidavits. Now, service of judgments, final orders, or resolution. Okay. Okay. Judgments, final orders, or resolutions okay, shall be served either personally or by registered mail. Ex parte motion of any party in the case, a copy of the judgment, final order, or resolution may be delivered by accredited courier at the expense of such. When a party summoned by publication has failed to appear in the action, judgments, final orders, or resolutions against him or her shall be served upon him or her also by means of publication at the expense of the prevailing party. So how do you serve or what are the different modes of serving judgments and final orders or final resolutions? Personal service. Number two, registered mail. Number three, publication if summons was served through publication. And number four, upon the filing of an ex parte motion and the same being approved by the court, it can be served through an accredited private courier upon, of course, prior court approval and payment by the movement of the expects, expenses to be incurred to effect the same. So I think it is quite clear from section 13 that you cannot serve, okay, uh, final judgments, final orders, or final resolutions via ordinary mail. Kung sinerv mo via ordinary mail yan, dapat hindi aandar ang bilang to file an appeal. Kasi hindi naman siya mode of serving judgments or final orders. Okay. Now, section 14. Okay, if you read section 14, okay, 
Notwithstanding the foregoing, the following orders, pleadings, and other documents must be served or filed personally or by registered mail when allowed and shall not be served or filed electronically unless the permission is granted by the court. Okay? Kaya kanina may nagtatanong, paano yung filing ng complaint? Can it be done electronically? Okay. Initiatory pleadings and initial responsive pleadings such as an answer as a general rule can only be filed personally or by registered mail. Okay? It is only when it's allowed by the court that it can be filed electronically. Subpina, okay? Cannot be served electronically. Protection orders, TPOs, PPOs, or writs, writs of preliminary attachment, writs or writ of uh, temporary restraining order, writ of preliminary injunction, okay, must be served personally or personally or um, by registered mail, can be served only electronically if approved by the court. Appendices and exhibits to motions or other documents that are not readily amenable to electronic scanning may at the option of the party filing such be filed and served conventionally and sealed in confidential documents and records. That's a new provision. Okay. Now somebody asked, how do you authenticate signature of council party if filed by electronic means? I think that's a reason why if I were to file a pleading by electronically, I would make it by way of attachment. Okay, i-scan po na lang yan. Okay, para mas scan din yung signature ko, yun ang ipapile. Okay. Now, section 15, witness of service. Okay, let me just present it in summarized form. Okay. How will personal service, okay, personal service is deemed complete upon the actual receipt, okay, actual receipt. How about ordinary mail, completeness of ordinary mail upon the expiration of 10 calendar days after mailing, unless the court provides otherwise. How about registered mail, upon actual receipt by the addressee or other or after five days, okay, from the date he or she received the first notice of the postmaster, whichever date is earlier. And then your accredited private courier service is by accredited courier is complete upon actual receipt by the addressee, okay, or at least two attempts to deliver by the courier service or upon the expiration of five calendar days after the first attempt to deliver, whichever is earlier, okay. So, okay, and then of course, electronic service at the time of the electronic transmission of the document or when available at the time the electronic notification of service of the document is sent. So, dapat, as I said, yung pinaka sent button mo, kung ano nakalagay dun sa sent box. Electronic service is not effective or complete if the party serving the document learns that it did not reach the person to be addressing or person to be served. And then facsimile upon complete upon receipt by the party as indicated in the facsimile transmission printout. Pag-serve mo kasi niya, pagpadala mo, may lalabas na printout eh. That will be the evidence to show when it was really sent by facsimile transmission. Let me just go back to accredited private courier. Okay. Service, okay, service to the other party no? by accredited courier is complete upon actual receipt of the address. It was sinerve sa akin ng LBC, which is LBC, let's assume, is an accredited courier. Not sinerve sa akin, kunwari, pinadala ng November 5. Pero natanggap ko, November 6. Serve sa akin yun, November 6. Kasi is complete upon actual receipt by the address. Or, after at least two attempts to deliver by the courier service, or upon the expiration of five calendar days, after the first attempt to deliver, whichever is earlier. Okay. Let me just go back to registered mail. Okay. If, and it is reckoned from the first notice. So if I receive, let's say, a first notice in December 1, I went to the post office to claim it December 3. I deemed, it was served, deemed served upon me December 3. I went to the post office December 5. After I received the first notice December 1, deemed received ko yan December 5. But if I went to the post office December 7, okay, 
I received the first notice December 1. I am deemed under the law, deemed to have been served December 6. Kasi five days from December 1. Okay. Okay, now... Proof of filing, okay. When you file a complaint, let's say you file a pleading in court, you file your answer. What is the best proof, okay, that it was filed? Sabi ng first paragraph, proof of filing of the pleading is proven by the existence of it in record in the records of the court, uh, of the court's folder. So, ang best proof na na-file mo yan nasa court folder. Paano kung wala? Okay. What if the pleading is not in the court records, but you now claim that it has it that you claim to have filed it? The proof now will depend upon the mode of filing. If personal service, how what will be your proof? It is proven by the written or stamped acknowledgement of its filing by the clerk of court on a copy of the pleading or court submission. Kasi pag nagpa-file ka, yung kopya mo, dapat may tatak din ng, ng clerk na tumanggap, no? Yan ang magiging proweba mo. How about if you filed it by registered mail? The filing shall be proven by the registry receipt, by the affidavit of the person who mailed it, containing a full statement of the date, place, and deposit of the mail in the post office in a sealed envelope addressed to the court, with postage fully prepaid and with instructions to the postmaster to, retire, to, to return the mail to the sender after 10 calendar days if not delivered. Three. Okay. Kung paano kung finile mo by a credit, you claim, finile mo, and you filed it via accredited private courier, pero pagdating mo sa records of case, wala doon yung pleading. How will you prove that you, were, you filed the pleading by accredited private courier? The filing shall be proven by an, an affidavit of the person who brought the pleading, okay, or other document to the service provider together with the courier's official receipt and the document tracking number. Kaya huwag iwawala yung tracking number. Okay. Again, another situation. You claim that you have filed it electronically, pero pag tingin sa records ni, ni judge, wala dun yung pleading. So it is now incumbent upon you that you really filed it electronically. So, how can you prove that it was filed through authorized electronic means? It shall be proven by an affidavit of electronic filing of electronic filing of the party accompanied by a copy of the electronic acknowledgement of its filing by the court. Okay, in other words, kung sino yung gumawa nun, magawa ng affidavit at magkalakip ng kopya. Okay? Papatunay to support the, the representations made by the person who prepared the affidavit. Okay. Proof of service of pleading. Okay, pinag-usapan natin natin kanina, proof of filing. Now we're going to discuss proof of service of pleading. Okay. If the pleading was sent by ordinary mail, an affidavit of the person mailing stating the fact showing compliance with Section 7 of this rule. Now, a written admission of the party served or the official return of the service or the affidavit of the party serving containing a statement of the date, place, and manner of service. If the pleading was served read by registered mail, again, another affidavit. The registry receipt issued by the mailing office. The registry return card shall be filed immediately upon its receipt by the sender or in lieu thereof, the unclaimed letter together with the certified or sworn copy of the notice given by the postmaster to the addressee. By accredited private courier, how will you prove the service, okay, if you did it by private courier? Affidavit of service executed by the person who brought the pleading or paper to the service provider together with the courier's official receipt and the document tracking number. And by electronic mail or facsimile, the affidavit of the person who executed, the, who sent the email, okay, kung sino yung pumindot siya ang gagawa ng affidavit of service or yung gumawa ng cause the electronic transmission together with a printed proof of transmittal. Okay. Look at your section 18. It says, the court may electronically serve orders 
and other documents to all parties in the case which shall have the same effect and validity as provided herein. Okay. A paper copy of the order or other document electronically served shall be retained and attached to the record of the case. Now I have a question. Okay. You read section 18 in relation to section 13. Okay. Section 13 under the 2019 rules specifically provides service of judgments, final orders, or resolutions can be served either personally, electronically, or upon approval of the court, okay, can be served through accredited courier. Does Section 18 now allows, okay, that service be done uh, of, of judgments, uh, of final orders, can it be done electronically? Okay. This is my personal opinion. Okay. I don't think so. When it comes to service of judgments, final orders, or resolutions, okay, I think it can only be served pursuant to Section 13 because it specifically addresses final, judge, uh, final orders or final resolutions or judgments. It can only be served personally by registered men or, or if allowed by the court, yan, pwede yan by uh, authorized private courier. Or if someone was served, okay, by publication and then publication. But when it comes to others, okay, it cannot be served electronically. Okay. If a motion to dismiss was denied, okay, that is an interlocutory order that is not a final order. Now, if the court allows it, that order denying the motion to dismiss can be electronically served. Okay? Now, on the other hand, if, for example, um, if, it's the, if, if the motion to dismiss has been granted, that's a final order. Why? Because nothing else, okay, will have to be done by the court. Can it be served electronically? With all due respect, I think Section 13 should prevail. Okay, notice of lease pendants, which is under Section 19, walang pagbabago. Okay. Now, okay, this is my concern. Okay. Um, rule 14 is very long. I will not be able to finish it in 30 minutes, and it's already uh, 4.30. Maybe... I can answer some of your questions now. I'll try, I'll try to read some, okay? So that when I start, okay, if I start on Thursday, I will start with Rule 14. Kasi bitin pag sinimulan ko yung Rule 14 ngayon, hindi ko siya matatapos in 30 minutes, okay? Now, I do not know. Okay, send. Is sending by email, assuming agreed upon, should be it be done only within business hours or could it be done within the day? Like for example, 11.59. Thank you for your question. My distinguished colleague, Attorney Rojas. Okay, Cynthia Rojas. Wala namang nilagay kasi yung court eh, kung anong oras. Kaya palagay ko basta within the day siguro yan. Kasi anytime pwede kang magpadala. So dahil wala namang limits na oras na binigay ang court, but the, when it comes to electronic service, I think we can serve it anytime within, basta within the day. Okay. Now, um, sa electronic service via, uh, sa service via electronic mail, uh, same question. Okay. This is, if personal filing, what does the pleading need to have an attached affidavit of service? Yes. Okay. The rules are silent about this. I think. Yes, but normally, you know, some courts, they really ask for an affidavit of service. So the rule is we might as well prepare an affidavit of service, okay? Because some courts in practice, they require the submission of an affidavit of service. Must okay if attached and dapat PDF copy to avoid inadvertent deletion. Very good. I think that's a good suggestion. How do you authenticate? Okay, I think I answered that already. Okay, I am. Uh, um, what is it? Hello, Dean. With regards to substituted service, if the first two modes are not available, is there a need now to utilize the service through accredited courier or facsimile? No, 
no yung substituted service kasi pag binasa natin dal- failure lang sa dalawang modes yung personal at saka by registered name tapos pwede ka na mag-substitute based on the way the um, the rule was written okay section 9 rule 13 first paragraph what is the mode of obtaining consent in writing you can file a joint manifestation in court you can file an ex parte motion and the court can make a ruling on it the other party will just file a manifestation agreeing to it okay can you discuss and reconcile sections 5 and 8 uh, i think i already disagreed with sections 5 and 18 5 sections 5 rule 13 Wait, just give me a minute please let me look section 5 modes of service and 18 ah okay five personal service this is personal service by if you're trying to serve your pleading by by uh, personal, you, you, you bring it, you bring a copy to the opposing counsel, okay? Okay, you bring it to the office. If not, if the office, if he does not have any office or if he does not have any, or if his office is unknown, but you know the man where the council lives, then you can bring it to the office, to the residence of the said council. And I think court issued orders and other documents Yun naman yung orders na ini-issue ng court. Okay? That's the difference between 15, six, between, I'm sorry, it's 5 and 18 pala. Modes of service. Okay? Modes of service, yung modes of service meaning yung service panel ipadala dun sa kabila. Yung court-issued orders, yung nagdagaling yung, yung order sa court. Okay? Ito naman yung modes of service sa 5, yan yun naman yung nagdagaling sa abogado isa-serve mo sa kabilang abogado. Okay, uh, let me see. Section 9, okay, same. Okay. Is there a need for filing of actual hard copy in court if service is done by electronic means? No, no need. Okay, I, I know that I have taken so much of your time. It's 4.30 and I think it will be very unfair if I continue with rule 14 and then bitin naman. So I will have to stop here. I, I hope you learned something from today. And then I will see you on Wednesday. Same time, I will start at 2 o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. I will collate all the questions and try to answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a COVID-free day. Bye-bye. How do I do this? Okay. <laughs>